Hello. <laughs> uh, I'm Cheryl Brunkish, and I am chair of the Community Advisory Board for Genocide Awareness Week and president of the Phoenix Holocaust Association. And I'm so happy to see you all here tonight. And we have uh, our, the honor of hearing from the Phoenix Boys Choir under the direction of artistic director, Herbert Washington. We had the Boys Choir last year for our key, before our keynote speaker. And they were so wonderful that we thought we had to bring them back again this year. So please help me welcome the Phoenix Boys Choir.
That's why we have a mic right here. So. The first piece, as you heard, is an arrangement by Rollo Dilworth, um, an African-American composer, which is great getting up more. And the second piece, we travel all the way to England, and we sing a piece by John Rutter, um, English composer. This is called The Lord Bless You and Keep You. Um, and then I will introduce a special guest who will um, conduct the final, two, final piece with two wonderful soloists. This season, we've had the pleasure of uh, partnering with ASU in several ways, of course, with um, Volke, Ben Kurt, um, and also with ASU uh, choral program with Dr. Jay Saplan, who's new as director of choral activities. And uh, we talked, and we talked about having a graduate student join the Phoenix Boys Choir, as, and as I uh, can mentor that student and provide more podium time and. Um, and so it's been a wonderful uh, relationship with ASU. And so I want to introduce to you uh, Mr. Colin Cossey, who is working on his master's uh, here at ASU. This piece uh, titled uh, We Rise Again uh, will be performed by two soloists, um, Ben Whitsett, And Lucas Bankert, yes, he's the tall one in the back, yes, and conducted by Mr. Colin Cossey. Thank you so much for having the Phoenix Boys Choir here today, and I look forward to uh, the speaker today. Wonderful. Yeah. May I have the second microphone?
So now it is my honor to introduce our evening's keynote speaker, Julieta Vals Noyce. She's a career member of the Senior Foreign Service who was Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of Population, Refugees, and Migration. PRM, as it's known, leads the U.S. government's response on refugees and plays a critical role in humanitarian response to global crises. Ambassador Noyes has a long and impressive resume with our government. Previously, she served as Deputy Director and Acting Director of the Foreign Service Institute, and she was the U.S. Ambassador to the Republic of Croatia, a NATO ally and member of the European Union. Prior to her posting in Croatia, Ambassador Noy served as Deputy Assistant Secretary, Bureau of European and Eurasian Affairs, where she managed, managed relations with 12 European countries and the European Union. As Deputy Executive Secretary for the Department of State from 2011 to 2013, Ambassador Noyes managed trips and oversaw the preparation of briefing materials for two secretaries of state. Her background also includes several years where she was deputy chief of mission at the U.S. Embassy to the Holy See. And I just see a hand pointing when I read the Holy See. So that uh, must have been quite an incredible experience. She's a graduate of Wellesley College, and Ambassador Noyes has a master's degree from the National Defense University. She speaks Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, as well as some French. And I'm jealous of her ability to do that. She's the recipient of numerous honors and, and awards. And I have something in common with Ambassador Noyes. I don't speak any other language, so that isn't it. But we are both first-generation Americans whose parents entered the United States as refugees. My parents came to this country after World War II, after surviving the Holocaust, while her parents were refugees from Cuba. Help me welcome Ambassador Noyes to the podium. Can you hear me now? It's on? It's on. It's on. I was afraid Cheryl was going to keep reading my resume, and that would take all night, because I worked for the State Department for a long time. But thank you, Cheryl, for that very kind introduction. And many thanks also to Dr. Um, Tim Langeel from ASU's School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies, Ambassador Ed O'Donnell from uh, the School of Politics and Global Studies, and all of the organizers of this week's Genocide Awareness Week for honoring me with the invitation to deliver tonight's keynote address. It's been such a pleasure to reconnect with Ed he and I worked together on Panama issues uh, way back when, when, uh, when General Noriega was still in charge down in Panama. And it's been an equal pleasure to meet so many dedicated, engaged ASU faculty, students, and others today. And this visit has left me absolutely reassured that our future is in good hands. I would also like to raise this a little bit, if it's possible. Yeah, that'll work. OK. We need to rely on the leaders who are being molded here at ASU um, and at so many other institutions of higher learning as we confront a terrible scourge that continues to plague our world, the issue that you've been discussing all week, and that's genocide. The United States government has categorically condemned and fought against genocide for around the globe for decades, from the Holocaust to the Srebrenica massacres to the slaughter of Tutsis in Rwanda, to extermination campaigns 
waged against Kurds, Yazidis, and Darfuris. The United States has also continuously demanded accountability for perpetrators of crimes against humanity. But alas, genocide is not just a sad chapter in history books. In 2021, then Secretary of State Mike Pompeo condemned the People's Republic of China for its ongoing genocide and crimes against humanity in Xinjiang province. We continue to stand against the PRC's ongoing genocide and crimes against humanity, and we will continue to take action against PRC officials involved in these crimes. Then again, in 2022, our current Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, declared that the military regime in Myanmar had committed genocide against the Rohingya people. But just as genocide continues, so do the actions of honorable people and nations to confront and offer support to its intended victims. From the very beginning of our history, the United States has provided safe haven to those forced to flee genocide and other forms of violence and persecution. Indeed, the first European settlers in this country were themselves fleeing religious persecution. So today, I'd like to talk to you about how our nation helps those fleeing oppression. Just a few weeks ago was my one year anniversary as confirmation of as Assistant Secretary of State for Population, Refugees, and Migration. I took the oath of office just five weeks after Russia launched its full-scale aggression against Ukraine, its latest aggression against Ukraine, sending millions of innocent civilians fleeing into neighboring countries for safety. Just a week later, I was on an airplane to Poland and Moldova to see firsthand the response to Europe's largest refugee crisis since World War II. And then, just weeks after that, on April 21st, President Biden announced a program that we called Uniting for Ukraine, or because we're U.S. government officials and we love acronyms, U for You. Through U for You, Ukrainian nationals and others forced to flee Russia's aggression can apply to stay in the United States temporarily under the sponsorship of a U.S. citizen. Arizona knows the program well. Arizonans have sponsored and welcomed over 500 humanitarian parolees under U for You. And I was deeply moved to hear how even before we launched U for You, local Arizona community leaders and institutions like the Ukrainian American Society of Tucson, St. Michael's Ukrainian Catholic Church of Tucson, and the Southeastern Arizona Ukrainian Care Network mobilized to provide those fleeing Russia's aggression with the warmest of welcomes. And Ukrainians are getting ongoing support here in Arizona until it is safe for them to go home. Now, I'm sure that this isn't news to those of you gathered today, but what you may not know is that Arizona's u for u sponsors and others like them all across the United States are keeping alive a long and beautiful American tradition that is nearly as old as our country itself, older even than the state of Arizona. They are offering a helping hand to vulnerable people in need. Today, with the support of countless Americans across our nation, the State Department oversees refugee resettlement in the United States through the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program. And since I mentioned that we liked acronyms, we call it USREP. Since Congress created USREP through the Refugee Act of 1980, the United States has admitted over 3 million refugees. That's an achievement we can all be proud of, and it reflects a history that began long before 1980. Because people fleeing war, fleeing violence, persecution, and genocide have been arriving on America's shores for centuries. From those early days of our nation, right up until we created the formal refugee admissions program, private American citizens have been working through their neighborhoods and their faith communities to respond to global atrocities by welcoming these victims of war and persecution and genocide to start new lives right here in America. 
little bit of history. In 1881, the total Jewish population of the United States stood at about 250,000 individuals. But anti-Semitic sentiment was spreading through the Russian Empire, sparking anti-Jewish riots and large-scale violent attacks on Jewish communities. These widespread pogroms were fueling or fueled by economic changes resulting from rapid industrialization and by disinformation about the Jewish community's role in Tsar Alexander II's assassination. Introduced that same year in 1881, the Russian Empire's May laws, restricting Jews' movements and economic activities further fueled the violence. As thousands of homes were destroyed and their families plunged into poverty, Russia's Jews began seeking safety far from home. Many thousands eventually arrived at the legendary New York Immigration Processing Center, Ellis Island. New York's then small Jewish community sprang into action, creating the world's oldest refugee agency. In 1892, the Hebrew Sheltering House Association and Women's Auxiliary formed to organize shelters, meals, transportation, and jobs for arriving Jews from Russia. Over the next two decades, the association would expand its services, establishing a soup kitchen and a dormitory, and it would change its name, becoming the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. In 1904, the Society established a bureau on Ellis Island to provide assistance and translation services, guiding new arrivals through medical screenings and arguing appeals with authorities to prevent their deportation. Their work continued here in the United States and eventually expanded all around the globe. Today, they are known simply as HIAS. Maybe they have some government officials, so they like acronyms too. But today they are known as HIAS, and we are proud, we are very proud, that they are one of the 10 national resettlement agency partners that works with the United States government to resettle newly arrived refugees of every religion, ethnicity, and national origin. As HIAS President Mark Hetfield says, we started this work because they were Jewish. We continue it because we are Jewish. Hyas may have been the first refugee agency to emerge from an engaged, committed group of private citizens motivated by the horrors of persecution, genocide, and ethnic cleansing. But they were far from the last. The outbreak of World War I sparked a new wave of refugee flight from Europe, an American communities once again answered the call. Lutheran Immigrant and Refugee Services, today known as LIRS, began operations in 1918 as the Welfare Committee of the National Lutheran Council. They helped to resettle 522 European Lutheran refugees in the United States in their first year of operations. By the end of World War II, LIRS had facilitated the resettlement of over 30,000 Europeans. Today, LIRS is another of our resettlement agency partners. And then, in the aftermath of the Holocaust, history's most catastrophic genocide, members of 17 Christian denominations came together as the Church World Service to, in their words, to do in partnership what none of us could hope to do alone. CWS, again with the acronyms, CWS resettled 100,000 refugees in its first 10 years of operation. When Congress passed the Refugee Act in 1980, CWS had already resettled over 350,000 refugees. And guess what? Today, CWS is another of our national resettlement agency partners 
And that number is over 865,000. The names of so many of the individuals who came to the United States during those early years of organized, though unofficial, refugee resettlement are familiar to us all. Philosopher Hannah Arendt, artist Mark Chagall, and former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright were among them. Later waves of refugees carried yet more familiar names. Cuban artists Gloria Stefan and Andy Garcia, whose families fled the rise of the Castro regime in the 1950s and 60s. Ballet dancer Mikhail Baryshnikov, who defected from the Soviet Union while on tour in Canada and then later settled in New York. And this year's Oscar winner for Best Actor, Ki Hui Kwan, whose family fled the devastation of the Vietnam War for a refugee camp in Hong Kong before resettling in California. Hundreds of thousands more people like them also relied on the goodwill and friendship of strangers to help find safety and build new lives in the United States in the decades before we created a formal refugee resettlement infrastructure. And as I mentioned earlier, since we launched USRAP in 1980, we have resettled 3 million more refugees in this nation and counting. I'm working on making that number higher. They include people fleeing from genocide and ethnically motivated violence from all over the world. And again, as I mentioned earlier, in March 2022 at the United States Holocaust Museum, Holocaust Memorial Museum, Secretary Blinken announced his determination that members of Burma's military committed genocide and crimes against humanity against Rohingya. In December 2022, I traveled to Bangladesh, which hosts nearly one million Rohingya refugees. There, I was honored to announce an agreement with the Bangladeshi government to resettle the most needy Rohingya refugees in the United States. Working closely with the UN High Commission for Refugees, the program offers hope to some of the most vulnerable victims of the Burmese military's crimes. But there's more work to do. Soon after he took office in January 2021, President Biden announced an ambitious goal of resettling 125 refugees in the United States each year. Our team got to work right away with our resettlement agency partners, including the three that I mentioned earlier, to find ways to meet the president's target. After many years of low refugee admissions, we knew the work of not only rebuilding the infrastructure, but expanding it would be hard. But we couldn't have predicted how global events could transpire to make it even harder. Just seven months later, on August 15th, 2021, we were all watching as the Taliban swept into Kabul, sending tens of thousands of Afghans fleeing, among them thousands who had worked directly with US military officers and diplomats. Over the next six months, over 85,000 Afghans would resettle in new home communities in the United States, thanks to the extraordinary efforts of teams from the State Department, the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Health and Human Services, and our resettlement agency partners across the country. Institutions like Arizona State University also did their part, and I have been honored over the last couple of days to meet with a group of Afghan young women resettled here with the generous support of ASU and of the International Rescue Committee. This was the single largest humanitarian airlift since the Second World War. And this important work continues because our commitment to helping our Afghan allies is enduring. The Afghan relocation effort was the ultimate stress test for our resettlement infrastructure, but it was also an incubator. The solutions that we devised under those emergency situation, under the, those emergency conditions became an impetus for long-term innovations that will help get us closer to meeting the president's ambitious refugee resettlement targets. 
After the initial exodus, for example, we had to rely on generous partner governments to host Afghans for processing en route to their final destination here in the United States. So to avoid abusing their hospitality, we had to make sure that our Afghan guests were moving through these temporary facilities as quickly as possible. So we found ways to streamline our comprehensive refugee vetting process without compromising its integrity. We also found ways to harness the outpouring of interest and offers of assistance from the American public. At the same time that the president announced his ambitious resettlement target, he directed us to develop a pilot program for private refugee sponsorship. We were hard at work on that program when Kabul fell in August of 2021, and our program was not quite ready for prime time. But we took the idea, and in partnership with friends from the private, and, from the private sector and NGO sectors, we launched the Sponsor Circle for Afghans just two months later, in October 2021. Under Sponsor Circle, small groups of American citizens could pool their financial resources and pledge their time to support newly arrived Afghans starting lives in the United States. The response was overwhelming. It was no surprise that veterans groups from across the country were the earliest responders, eager for new ways to help the Afghans who had helped them. But I'll admit that I was moved to tears. I was literally moved to tears when I discovered that some of the very first sponsor circles were groups of Vietnamese Americans, Vietnamese American refugees and their descendants. What's more, they thanked us for giving them the opportunity to repay the debt of gratitude they felt that they owed to the United States for coming to their aid 50 years earlier when they and their families were forced to flee the ravages of the Vietnam War. It was a familiar sentiment. I have spent my professional life in public service for the same reason. As Cheryl mentioned, my own parents came to the United States as refugees from Cuba following the rise of the Castro regime, long before the Refugee Act of 1980 and the establishment of the formal U.S. Refugee Admissions Program. And like others who I've mentioned today, they relied on the generosity of neighbors and community groups to start a new life in the United States. Over 60 years later, my mom was by my side in Miami a few weeks ago, welcoming newly arrived refugees to what she told them was the greatest country in the world. Mom is one of the biggest fans, therefore, of one of our newest innovations in refugee resettlement. This past January, just three months ago, we were proud to finally announce the launch of the Welcome Corps. Welcome Corps is a private sponsorship program that will give even more private Americans, everyday American citizens, an opportunity to get involved directly in the work of refugee resettlement, contributing financial resources and personal time to welcome refugees in the U.S. RAP, in the USRAP pipeline just like Americans welcome new neighbors moving to their neighborhood from anywhere. Now, Welcome Corps won't replace the vital work of our 10 resettlement agency partners. Rather, it will complement the work of these partners and expand our capacity to resettle refugees through USREP. And I know that many of you are going to want to get involved. And so I encourage you, write this down, I encourage you to visit WelcomeCore.org for more information. But perhaps most importantly, Welcome Corps is a direct link back to the community-centered origins of refugee resettlement in the United States. It was private citizens organizing their neighborhoods and their faith communities, not politicians or bureaucrats, who began the long, proud American tradition of welcoming refugees. It is thanks to their efforts, carried on today by Arizonans and other Americans across the country, that our flag remains an enduring symbol of our promise of freedom and refuge for the world's most vulnerable. It is my great honor to lead the U.S. government's efforts to keep that fundamental and uniquely American promise at the center of our foreign policy. 
With that, I'd like to again thank the organizers of today's event with honoring me with this invitation. And I want to thank all of you for joining us here today, whether you're in the room or watching virtually. And now I would be happy to take some questions. And I can even move this podium. Thank you. Ambassador Noyce, thank you so much for a very, very powerful statement and for all you and your team at the State Department are doing that affects the lives of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. Thank you very much. Very well said. Thank you, Ed. And the first question from the audience, what is the U.S. position on the horrific abuses against the Tigrayan people in Ethiopia? It uh, seems the U.S. has normalized relations uh, what, what's your statement about what's going on in Ethiopia today, uh, the peace agreement and the, the continuing conflict between the Tigrayan people and Ethiopian? Thank you, and it's a great question. And of course, we deplore human rights violations. We deplore the atrocities that we've seen in Tigray. The United States was very actively involved in efforts over many months to try to bring a peace agreement into into effect to support the efforts of African Union members to negotiate that agreement. The United States also provides a great deal of humanitarian assistance to support the people uh, affected by that fighting and by that crisis. Uh, but sadly, it's just one crisis. I mean, you're mentioning Tigray. For the last two or three days, I've been watching the situation in Sudan. In just the report that I saw this morning, in just the last two or three days, we've seen 30,000 people leave Sudan and flee to Chad for safety. And the world passed a grim milestone uh, last year when the UN High Commissioner for Refugees announced that over 100,000 people are forcibly displaced around the world. Today, that number is more like 105 million people. That is 1% of the world's population, and it is the highest number ever registered in human history. There are so many people who are in such dire circumstances around the world. And we have, I believe, a responsibility to do what we can to help them with humanitarian assistance, with humanitarian advocacy and diplomacy, with outreach to other, our partners, uh, other donor countries, other international organizations. But ultimately, the goal is to create conditions in the places where these atrocities are, con are occurring, to create the conditions so that people can someday return safely, voluntarily, and sustainably to their home country. Because that, in the end, is what most people really want. So we deplore the atrocities. Did I just turn this? OK. Uh, we deplore the atrocities in Tigray, just as we deplore the atrocities that are happening in Sudan, in Myanmar in Syria, in Venezuela, and in so many other places around the world, sadly. But we can't give up hope. We have to keep working on it. Thank you. There are two questions about uh, Afghan women students here at, uh, at Arizona State University and also in the United States, mm -hmm. uh, the Asian University for Women in Bangladesh. Uh, they cannot go home. Uh, what's the steps? after graduation here for staying here in the United States. And also the second question is about scholarships available uh, to help uh, people from Afghanistan, Ukraine, and others here okay, in the United so States. With regard to decisions uh, related to how people uh, can obtain legal status in the United States, that is not the work of the Department of State. That's actually the work of the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, however, the Department of State is actively involved in and continues to lobby uh, the Congress to pass the Afghan Adjustment Act, which would give people who were evacuated, all of those Afghans who I mentioned in my remarks, who we evacuated in the largest humanitarian airlift since the Second World War, to give them a permanent status. They came in with humanitarian parole, which gives them a two-year two stay in the country. 
uh, but the goal is to get them permanent status so that they can get their green cards and someday perhaps even become American citizens. That legislation is pending before the Congress. The administration strongly supports it, and we hope to see action from the Congress on that soon. With regard to um, scholarships, the State Department is not a university, so I can't speak to that, but I know that there are some amazing and generous people here at Arizona State University and at many other universities around the country I can also, who, who might have better answers. But I can also mention that as part of the Welcome Corps, the private sponsorship initiative, we are looking at having a small pilot program in the second phase of that initiative that would um, include a refugee path for people entering as students. So able to come in as students and then ultimately convert their status to become to permanently refugees and to be able to resettle here permanently. Thanks. And by the way, if you haven't met any of these Afghan women students, meet them. They're amazing. They're inspiring. Their life stories are um, very painful, but learning more about them and talking to them and hearing their stories and seeing their resilience is truly inspiring. And I have, uh, I have really enjoyed my conversations with them over the last couple of days. This is from those dialing in uh, online, uh, what measures is the State Department taking to ensure equitable and fair access to resettlement programs and resources for refugees and migrants from all backgrounds, including LGBTQI plus individuals and those from marginalized communities? So I'm really glad to get that question. The U.S. Refugee Admissions Program is a global program with global reach, and we do not discriminate in any way, shape, or form on the basis of nationality. We currently accept refugees from all over the world. In fact, one of the largest groups that we're seeing arriving over the last few months are Congolese, but we are also bringing in refugees from Central America, from Bangladesh, from Jordan. Uh, I have visited refugees in all of these locations, and we work very hard to admit refugees from around the world. Um, but I'm really glad to get the question about uh, uh, refugees who may be um, from LGBTQI plus community or people who are refugees who have additional vulnerabilities, not just the fact that they're refugees, but they may be people living with disabilities or older refugees, people who have additional vulnerabilities. And we recognize that these, that all refugees need protection, all refugees need support, but some need a little extra help and a little extra protection because they are more vulnerable. Uh, we recognize, for example, that LGBTQI plus refugees within a, a particular group of refugees may be afraid to make public their sexual orientation based on the fact that they could be re-victimized within the refugee community itself. So we are looking for new ways to reach those populations, and we um, have emphasized to our main referral partner, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, our desire to reach people with these particular vulnerabilities and our desire that they refer them to us for resettlement. But we are also initiating a pilot program to have uh, non-governmental organizations, to give particular non-governmental organizations the ability to refer specific groups of refugees to us. And so those programs from NGOs now are focused on LGBTQI+, um, on refugees living with disabilities, on older refugees, and on persons from Central America. Another, another question from an online viewer. How is the State Department collaborating with other government agencies and foreign government agencies and international organizations to address the root causes of displacement, migration, particularly in regions experiencing conflict and environmental crises? So there's a ton of questions wrapped up into one there. Let me see if I can tackle them. So first of all, the refugee resettlement um, process is an interagency process within the US government. It involves the Department of State, the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Health and Human Services. We each bring work into this effort. We each have a different part 
of the of the uh, of the puzzle. We work with our international organization partners. They're the ones who send us the referrals, particularly the UNHCR, uh, but also NGOs. Uh, send us the referrals of people with particular vulnerabilities who need resettlement because they may not get another durable or a better durable solution. But the root causes question is something that I really want to tackle. Um, we can't, the United States is one country. Last year, in fiscal year 2022, the United States, with the generous uh, support of the American taxpayers, the United States provided $17 billion in humanitarian assistance around the world. That accounted for 50% of the global response to UN emergency appeals, 50% just from the United States. It was incredibly generous, but it wasn't enough. There are so many refugees, there are so many people in need. Um, the Europeans are also dealing with all of the consequences of the war in Ukraine and all of the refugees who have come out of, of Ukraine. So we recognize that we need to do a lot more in terms of expanding the donor base, of working more closely with the private sector, of working more closely with the World Bank and multilateral um, institutions to increase funding for fragile situations, but also to get to use our diplomacy, our humanitarian diplomacy, to get at those causes. Why is it that people are fleeing? You know, is it, is it climate change? Is it conflict? Is it gender-based violence? Is it gang violence? So we have, in addition to our humanitarian assistance, we have a number of development assistance programs in countries around the world, and we work very closely with other countries and other partners to try to get to those root causes, to try and address those causes so that people no longer need to leave their countries, or if they've left, so they can return. Um, it's a longer term effort, it's a more complicated effort, but it's absolutely worth doing because we cannot continue the way that we are. There just aren't enough resources and the needs are growing every year. So we have to get creative, we have to be determined, we have to spread the word, um, and we have to really work with other countries and other partners and talk about responsibility sharing and talk about um, diplomacy and development and, and advocacy. So lots and lots of pieces to this puzzle. We're trying to do all of them at the same time. Refugee resettlement is a clearly a complex endeavor requiring governments, NGOs, and the private citizens and private sector. What What's the most significant gap in the current network of institutions? What would you like to have done better in that cooperative network? I, you know what I would say right now, Ed, and whoever the person is who asked this wonderful question, um, I think the biggest gap right now is scale. There's just so many people in need, and there are so, there, there, there are a limited number of people who we can resettle in this country. We have a limited amount of resources to be able to do it, although we're incredibly generous. Um, frankly, I think other countries need to do more. Some countries like Canada, Canada's incredibly generous with refugee resettlement. Other countries are initiating new refugee resettlement programs, countries like Brazil. Um, Spain is starting to do more. So there's more that needs to be done but frankly, I think the biggest gap is just the, the amount, the number of spaces, the number of, of countries, and the, the scale at which we are able to provide this, this solution for people. Two more questions, if okay. we may, and then we'll let you tell you, take a break. Okay. <laughs> yeah, rest your voice, but thank you for taking these questions. Can you discuss the current policies and procedures in place for processing and granting asylum requests and how has the department, State Department adapted to changes in migration patterns and global events? So um, asylum and refugee status determinations are like twins separated at birth. <laughs> the same conditions that are used to determine whether someone qualifies to be determined as a refugee and qualifies for assistance as a refugee or resettlement as a refugee are the same conditions, but and th these conditions are measured and are evaluated 
through interviews and through a, lo a lot of work by international organizations and U.S. government officials um, from the Citizenship and Immigration Service. But these are conditions that are evaluated when people are overseas. Asylum uses the exact same criteria, but it uses them to evaluate people once they have entered the United States. Conditions are the same, but it is where they are evaluated and how they are processed that differs. The UN Refugee Agency, the State Department, the Department of Homeland Security are involved in refugee determinations. It is the Department of Homeland Security alone that makes determination, and the Department of Justice also plays a role uh, with regard to asylum decisions. There was a second part to that question, I don't remember. Okay, I covered it. I think you covered it. There was a lot there. Okay, there was. Thank you. Uh, and then the final question. What, what's the second phase of the private sponsorship? Uh, when is it starting? And could you go over the timelines about sure. the, the private? Uh, so in the Welcome Corps, the first phase of the Welcome Corps, what we are doing is we are matching refugees who are already in the USREP pipeline with private sponsors who step up, who they, they have some conditions they need to meet. They have to uh, take some training. They have to create a welcome plan that gets approved by a consortium of experts. They have to raise money. They have to have a whole plan for how they're going to meet the refugees at the airport on arrival, find um, affordable housing, get the kids registered in school, help them find jobs, help them sign up for English classes, show them what bus routes to take, how to get a library card, all the things that you need to do to learn to be someone who can be settled in the United States. So the first phase of that program, we, um, the people working on refugee admissions, will make those, those matches between people already in the pipeline and the private sponsor group. In the second phase of the program, it is our intention to allow private sector groups, private sponsors, to identify refugees who are overseas who they would like to sponsor. Now, these individuals will still have to meet all of the criteria for refugee status determination. This isn't going to be like a family reunification program or, or a new immigration pathway. In order to qualify for resettlement under Welcome Corps, people do have to meet the criteria for refugee resettlement. But in that second phase, the sponsors will be able to identify those refugees. And we're also looking in that second phase to do some pilots for students and potentially a, a labor pathway. But we're working on it. It's, uh, it's complicated. We are very grateful to our, to our friends and allies in Canada because they are a few steps ahead of us in all of this, and they're giving us some really good technical advice. But uh, we're hoping to roll out the second phase of the program later this year. Thank you. And thank you so much for being here on behalf of Genocide Awareness Week board and for being here in, in Tempe, ASU, and, and also for challenging, challenging us to, to help uh, welcome these these refugees from all over the world. Thank so you. So I want to thank you all for the invitation. I want to thank you all for for not forgetting the victims of genocide, for not forgetting that there are things that we can all do to try and help. And I invite you again, welcomecore.org. So I will run the advertisement twice, welcomecore.org. Thank you again for your time and attention. Okay, my name's Tim Langell. I was the chair of the board of directors for Genocide Awareness Week uh, this year. Uh, the director of the School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies, Richard Amesbury, will be making some concluding remarks. Uh, before that, I'm gonna say a few words myself. Uh, first, I want to announce Genocide Awareness Week 2024. Uh, the events of that will be uh, 
April 15th through 19th. Uh, don't know what that conference is going to look like yet, but that's when it's going to be. Uh, this week's been a huge success. Um, I think we got a lot to be proud of here. We've had incredible presenters. Um, we've had musical and cultural performances. We screened two films, including Aurora Sunrise, uh, which we screened this afternoon. That is, was Armenia's entry into the Oscars. It was a very moving film. We had talented musicians and performers, uh, survivors, scholars, politicians, and again, Assistant Secretary, thank you for your words and, and being here. Um, humanitarians, and our, our uh, theme this year was genocide, refugees, and diaspora. I don't have to speak too much more about that because the Assistant Secretary Noyes did a fantastic job outlining the timeliness of this with over 100 million forcibly displaced people. Seven out of 10 of those, 72% of those are from five countries, including Syria, Ukraine, Afghanistan, South Sudan. You can see the relationship between destruction, genocide, and uh, refugees. And Naomi Steinberg's here in the front row from Hyas. Uh, she and uh, Nidra uh, Sumik did a fantastic job talking about the work on the ground for this. Um, resettling refugees. Uh, we covered a lot of topics, the Armenian genocide, the Assyrian genocide, Holocaust, Bosnia, Ukraine, Myanmar, Uyghurs, themes like religion and genocide, gender, sexual violence, and genocide. These overlapping and intersecting uh, genocides, atrocities, and their legacies, including settler colonialism, anti-Semitism, anti-black racism, and genocide denial are all ongoing. And so, um, again, Assistant Secretary, as you outlined, this is not a thing of the past. This is ongoing, and this is a true crisis. And so, yeah, we look forward to thank you all for being here again this evening and all the people who attended and especially our speakers and our presenters who are absolutely fantastic. Uh, just, I couldn't be more proud of the lineup of people we had here. We're really doing a fantastic thing here at ASU um, and the way we're approaching this, but I will end it there and pass it on to uh, Director Richard Amesbury of the School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies to say the closing remarks of this uh, fantastic conference. Well, thank you so much, Tim. So thank you, uh, Ambassador Noyes, uh, and thank you to the Phoenix Boys Choir and uh, Director Herbert Washington. Uh, this has been a, a stimulating capstone uh, to a week of thought-provoking and uh, morally uh, inspiring uh, presentations and events, none of which would have been possible without the support of many stakeholders. So I have a lot of people and organizations to thank on behalf of the School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies, SHIPPERS. We also like our acronyms here at ASU. So first off, uh, the Rosenbluth Family Charitable Foundation, the Center for Jewish Studies, uh, excuse me, the Center for uh, Jewish Philanthropy, uh, Steve and Suzanne Hilton, uh, the Zorian Institute, St. Apkar Armenian Apostolic Church, SAFO Center, Fresno State Armenian Studies Program, the Phoenix Holocaust Association, Molly Blank Fund, and the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Uh, thank you for your support. Uh, Shippers would also like to thank our colleagues here at ASU, uh, including the Center for Jewish Studies, uh, the Malikian Center, the St Center for the Study of Religion and Conflict, the School of Politics and Global Studies, the School of Social Transformation, and the School of International Letters and Cultures. Uh, thanks as well to the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and in particular to uh, Jeffrey Cohen, who's uh, our Dean of Humanities. Uh, thank you for your support, Jeffrey. We'd also like to extend our gratitude to our colleagues and partners at Northern Arizona University and uh, the University of Arizona, namely the Martin Springer Institute and the Arizona Center for Judaic Studies. Many thanks uh, to our board of directors uh, for all of their hard work, to uh, Alex Alvarez, uh, Gil Raybach, uh, Hava Tiros-Samuelson, Volker Bankert, 
uh, Ambassador Edward O'Donnell, and especially to uh, Tim uh, Langell, for, who really uh, spearheaded uh, all of the events of uh, this past week. Um, as well as to our Community Advisory Board, which is led by uh, Cheryl Bronkesh, uh, the president of the Phoenix Holocaust Association, and includes uh, members Ramina uh, Jaju, Father uh, Zacharia, and uh, Judy Searle. And finally, I'd like to personally recognize some of our shippers' staff, uh, Becky Sang, Erica May, uh, Kalani Pickert, uh, Yvonne Delgado, and Rachel Bunning, uh, without whom none of this would have been possible. Please uh, join me in thanking uh, them. So thank you all for coming. We look forward to seeing you at future uh, Shippers events and as, as uh, Tim mentioned, at Genocide Awareness Week uh, next year. So have a good evening, everyone.